All right. Yeah, so Kenny sends me an email when I'm sitting on the plane and says, hey man, your, your headshot's too blurry. Can you give me a new one? And if anybody's ever seen my pictures on the internet, you know that I used to have long hair when I took my little vacation to do tech startup. And so I didn't really have anything presentable, so I did this selfie thing. <laughs> All right, so tonight we're going to talk about tips to make you better. Everybody was, uh, Kenny and Joseph and, and everyone were so kind to have me here. And I was asking him what this was all about. He said there's going to be AEs, SDRs, management in the room. I said, well, geez, let me just take 10 minutes, talk about some of the things that I've seen as my business partner and I have been working with companies of all different shapes and sizes, different industries across the globe. And that's what we're going to do. And my book's out there with Kite, if you all want to check it out, one of the books, and then the rest of them, we can chat later. I want to start with simple mistakes to avoid. Don't want to take too much time here, because look, these are simple mistakes. If you're professional, you shouldn't be doing this stuff. One, talk too much. Lots of people talk too much. We shouldn't. My business partner and I, we do this thing. We, we try to have a competition to see who can talk the least. Both him and I were on a discovery call one time, prospected 93% of the talking. It's possible if you listen and if you get really good at active listening and other techniques. Second one, like, um, you know, yeah. I've got this wearable device. It's very high tech. It's one of those wristbands. It says like um and you know it. And what you do is you snap your wrist whenever you say one of those words because it's bad for you. I coach my clients on this. I, it gets rid of 95% of them. Sheryl Sandberg uh, used to, see I just said it, um, okay, now I'm gonna snap myself. Sheryl Sandberg used to manage this woman named Kim Scott coming out of a meeting. She said, Kim, you sound like an idiot because you say um every sentence. Don't say um, basic stuff. Three, time management. If you're an AE, your calendar should look like this. If it doesn't, make it look like this. If you're an SDR, your AE's calendar should look like this. If it doesn't, what are you doing? Should have put a picture of the bobs. And then features and benefits. Look, we get features and benefits. Yeah, you should talk about pain. We all know this. I put in this is the category of basic stuff. We're not gonna talk about this today. Tonight we're gonna talk about the stuff where it gets a little bit harder. Most salespeople don't know their buyers. Yeah, sure, we sell to CFOs. CFOs deal with money, right? Can you write a CFO's job description, post it on LinkedIn, and attract top talent? If you sell to sales VPs, do you know what goes on here? Do you know what they do to prep for a board meeting? If you don't know your buyers from the job per description perspective, or maybe what they do before and after they talk to you during the day, how, what are you going to do? How are you going to sell these people? What about their week? These people do all of these things. If, in our second book, Sales Development, we talk about a, a case study where a CFO wakes up at 6 a.m., puts the kids off to school, does all of these things, and then gets a cold call at 11.43 a.m. If you don't know all of those things that happened before and after your cold call, how can you be one of their top five priorities and credibly tell them why they should do business with you? Fact. You can read. Fact two. <laughs> The best salespeople spend their time on deals that are going to close, and you can't do that if you don't know your buyers. We're going to move. Now we know our buyers. Do we start with open-ended questions or close-ended questions? Who says open-ended? Who says close-ended? All right, I like you right there. Because if we start with close, if we start with open-ended questions, we're saying, dear buyer, please run this sales process for me. Can you please tell me what we should talk about today? I don't like that. How about? I'm working with sales leaders who are struggling with X, Y, and Z. I don't suppose any of that resonates with you. Because if we do that, then we can find pain and we can go up open-ended. We can explore. We can start to get deeper, like our, our, our previous speaker was just talking about. And we can maybe figure out, hey, where's that opportunity to ask some more questions? Do we start with a closed-ended question? We ask another one? We ask some more questions? We don't find a reason to buy. Third try. I'm working with CFOs who are struggling with X, Y, and Z. None of that resonates. And if you frame it in the negative like that, they jump across the table if it does, and they say, yeah, it does, oh man, I'll tell you, we just got out of this meeting, it was crazy. And you finally find a reason to buy. Moving along to demos. So we've, we've identified our buyer personas, we figured out how to introduce these meetings, and look, nobody's on their cell phone. My KPI as a speaker, by the way, is cell phone usage, so I appreciate the, the attention that we're getting up here. It's gonna look good for my, my metrics when I get back home. So what should a demo look like? Here's what a demo usually looks like. Anybody's demo look like this? Gail's laughing. <laughs> Gail's seen demos like this before. <laughs> well, 
actually, sorry, I left an important part. What about that slide deck where you put all the logos from the other companies that bought from you? Hey, here's a feature, here's a feature, here's another feature. It's really cool and maybe, maybe you ask some questions and they just sit there and smile and nod. And if you're not on Zoom video chat or something like that, they're probably just not paying attention to you at all. This is what we like, demos that only show what solves pain. Agree, discovery is the hardest part of the sales process. If we do it well, then we step in here and we say, look, they only care about feature two and feature four. So where do we start the demo? Do we start with feature one because that's the first button that the product management team decided to build? No, we start with feature two. We say, look, we were talking the other day. It seems like this is something that could be relevant to you. So we're tying the pain to the features. Who has my book? Anybody pick it up out there? Page 65. My favorite page. If you fill out the table on page 65, the persona pain feature content matrix, it'll change your, it won't change your life, it'll make you better at selling. <laughs> and the other, another thing we talk about in the book when we're talking about demos, so what do, we, what do we talk about during the meeting? But how do we make sure our salespeople are qualified to go out and give demos? A lot of times companies will say, hey, give me a demo. So I set you down and I say, hey, give me a demo. So you're sitting there, you're, you're clicking around. You're like me up here. I've got a TV with my slides. And so you guys think I actually know what's on these slides. <laughs> and so he's clicking around on the buttons. He's, it's like bowling with bumpers. But one of the things we like to do for demo certification is, can the person draw the demo on the board? Head of sales, these two pain points, go. Draw what they should notice in the product and then tie that back to the pain that you uncovered during discovery. Whiteboard demo certification, if anybody's in enablement in the ops, it's a great way to figure out if your salespeople are good. And salespeople, you should just do it so that when the challenge comes, you're ready to rock. When should we talk about next steps in a meeting? When? What part of the meeting? Right away? What about the end of the meeting? Anybody see the end of the meeting? Now we talk about next steps at the beginning of the meeting. My friend Yogi Berra, who played for the New York Yankees, had this fun quote that I really like. Here's a framework we have. It's not in the book. It's, it's going to be in one of the future ones that Kenny was talking about. At the beginning of the meeting, we're just having little initial pleasantries, but then we pivot. Shall we talk about level jump? Sure, that's pivot. Now we're meeting mode. We're not just chit-chatting. Logistics, we schedule this call for 30 minutes. Does that still work? Are you expecting anybody else today? Cool, so now I've got buy-in, so I'm not going to say 15 minutes in. Oh, whoops, i got to go. <laughs> Agenda. What were you hoping to cover on this meeting today? Cover in this meeting today? I was talking to somebody out there. They said they struggle sometimes when prospects are asking questions because it feels like they're just barraging them with questions. Well, if we get permission from the prospects at the beginning of the meeting, if we say, Do you "I'd love to cover that. Do you mind if I ask you a bunch of questions?" Great. Now we've got buy-in from the prospect. And the next steps. No big decisions today. Typically, after a meeting like this, we either decide there's not a mutual fit or we schedule a 45-minute demo. Let's pause five minutes before the end of the meeting and see if that makes sense. So that's how we, we recommend people start their meeting. And then the plan becomes the closing process. You set the plan at the beginning of the meeting, you set next meeting's plan at the end of that meeting, and it creates momentum through the sales process. So you always know what's coming next, and the prospect always knows what decision am I gonna be making at the end of this meeting, so they know where they're headed. What if there's a gap between meetings? Anybody ever a meeting and then there's not another one for another, I don't know, three weeks? We help. We highlight what happened in that meeting. Maybe send a follow-up email, maybe a video over the top of that. Say, hey, here's what we covered. That way they can share it internally in your voice instead of their prospect playing telephone. We can educate, send them stuff in between meetings. Leverage the network. If they're hiring salespeople, stop talking about your software for a second and introduce them to somebody they can hire. And then finally predict, hey, we've got this meeting in a week. Typically, we want to prepare X, Y, or Z. Do you mind thinking about that a little bit beforehand? So we've done things in between meetings to help create momentum in the sales process, help the prospects. Next thing, what about asking for referrals? Do you know anybody that needs a sales enablement platform? <laughs> so these two people are having dinner after work. How was work? <laughs> it's, it's not how this goes down. She's saying these things. She's saying that they're doing uh, hiring salespeople, having underperformers, and all this kind of stuff. And so if you're going out saying, do you know anybody that needs a blank, whatever your product does, they never hear that. Professor Allen's wiki has this concept of selective attention. If we hear something, we see it. Every one of you is going to see a yellow 
uh, uh, Corvette, I forget, <laughs> yellow Corvette, instead, oh, too, I gotta stop myself. Yellow Corvette in the next month because you saw this, you've got selective attention and the people are gonna see that of your product as well. Objections. We see this, we call this objections. It's always a fun thing to talk about. Hey, let's, let's handle objections. From a psychology perspective, it's really reactance. Walk in the store, can I help you find anything? No, I'm just looking. Is that what we say? We teach, learn that at buyer school? No, it's just what everybody says. Skepticism, I don't know what your product's gonna do, I don't know if it'll work for me. And then inertia, how do we get people to actually change and make a decision? So when we think about objections, it seems like it's all over the place, but it really comes down to these three core concepts. And the way that we get around that, with the people I work with who aren't, uh, they're not, I said, oh, again, damn it. People that aren't experienced salespeople, I just say, look, just ask them a question. Don't go into it. I only had 10 minutes today. I figured I'd just throw a bunch of stuff out here, see if anything hits. That was a lot. And there's a bunch more. But here's the thing to realize. Lawyers go to law school. Accountants have accounting degrees. I didn't even put doctors up here. Med school for four years, residency for four years. Then they go become specialists. And then we go get English literature degrees at XYZ State University. They're like, hey, go hit your quota. What's up with that? So how are you gonna get better? <laughs> Read my books. Let's hang out on the internet. <laughs> I'm Corey. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, my question is, how do you kind of kill the, the radio silence after a demo and a pricing proposal? You like, put them in so much pain, there's no other option. It's gross negligence for them not to do business with you. <laughs> That's the answer. If you're not, if you're finding deep personal, I had a discovery meeting with the CEO yesterday. He told me if he doesn't solve this problem by his next board meeting, he personally is in huge problem, is in huge pain. Get them to say that. And look, it's not pain if you infer it. It has to come out of their mouth. If the prospect doesn't say it, it's not pain. Watch that. I can make something up and tell you, but there's nothing else to do. I gotta ask you in detail. Who else? Well, you know, my, you're yellow loud. Do, do you have a favorite uh, closing technique? Yeah, discovery. <laughs> I'm serious. Well, No, this is, I'm, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Now you're gonna get me emotional. This is how you close. You, you set a meeting agenda, you set the next steps, and then you close them on next steps, you close next steps every time you talk to them, and you win or you disqualify fast. Don't get second, second's expensive. Sir. What's the best way to get the decision maker in the second call? To get the decision maker on the second call? Yes. Why aren't they on the first call? Are you calling because low and trying to in hope for introductions? trying to find a good product. Sorry? So if I'm just, let's say, talking to the manager, yeah. but the SVP is gonna make, make the sale at the end, right. how do I get the SVP in the second meeting to make sure I'm not wasting my time? Sure, your discovery question should be so deep and so high level within the organization that the manager has no choice but to include that other person, otherwise they are practicing gross negligence. No, I mean, I'm, I'm not even being funny now. This is absolutely serious. If you are good enough at discovery, you will have those people say, oh, geez, I, I kind of need to. It's, it's, it's like somebody with a gunshot when rolling into a hospital. A doctor's going to come attend to them. I don't care if they were in line or not. It's serious. Last one. Can you drive urgency without pain? People buy for two reasons. They're either seeking reward or they're avoiding pain. Some people say fear is in the middle, but fear is the future anticipation of pain. If there's a huge reward down the road, yeah, maybe. Depends on what you're selling, but typically there's no urgency associated with pain. I've got some matrices around that, but I don't have them on the slides because I already had 40 slides and he told me to keep it tight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, round of applause for Corey. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna take one of those. Okay.